maybe I should start it. To make sure people can hear. Okay. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Can everyone? All right, so uh, we're, we're going to get uh, started here. If you can't hear us, um, just chat in um, and let us know, and we'll uh, adjust what's needed. Um, but yes, thank you all very much uh, for uh, participating. Um, we're excited to uh, share our experiences uh, with RED um, in, in Mexico so far, and, and a lot of the thoughts that uh, questions we've been asking ourselves um, uh, in the face of a lot of the critiques uh, about RED. Um, just to get started, um, I'm going to go over the agenda and then uh, let everybody introduce themselves. Um, so first we'll have an introduction about uh, who everyone is and what ecologic, how ecologic is involved with RED and then what RED is. And then at that point, uh, we will jump into uh, four main critiques about RED. Uh, uh, first with a five-minute description about what that critique is, and then a five-minute response to um, how it should be addressed or how it isn't being addressed and how we're managing it um, or thinking about managing it at our project site. Um, and then at the end of uh, going through all of the four critiques, uh, we'll open uh, up for some questions and some discussion uh, from all of you. So uh, first I will uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrea Savage, and I am the program manager for Carbon Plus, which is Ecologics uh, a program in Ecologic for addressing um, climate change and forest role in helping to mitigate climate change. Uh, and then I will let Brian introduce himself. Go Hi, ahead. I'm Brian Foster. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Carbon Plus and work with Andrea. Hi, I'm Anneli. I am a graduate student at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis and Waltham, and I've been focusing on gender and red. Um, my name is Meredith, and I'm also a graduate student at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management in Waltham, and have been looking more generally at Red Plus. And, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, I will tell you a little bit about um, how Ecologic is involved uh, with RED and, and, and why Ecologic is involved with RED. Um, as some of you might already know, uh, our Ecologic's mission is to empower rural and indigenous peoples to restore and protect tropical ecosystems in Central America and Mexico. Um, uh, we are pretty p passionate that uh, RED does provide uh, an opportunity for uh, some communities to address uh, conservation challenges that they haven't been able to address uh, with more common uh, conservation approaches, um, or that RED can help facilitate those more common conservation approaches, um, and despite the criticisms that, that RED is facing. Um, We'll get into those criticisms a little bit more and, and how, how we're working through them. But just to, uh, to explain how Ecologic is, is participating with these communities, it is primarily from as a te technical um, guide and an honest broker. Um, we feel strongly that uh, Ecologic should primarily serve as a facilitator through the RED process for the communities, but ultimately it's the communities that decide to develop a RED project and, and how it should be developed. Um, and 
Ecologic gives, helps the communities gain the information, um, knowledge, and skills that they need uh, to make those decisions. So first off, uh, we're going to uh, give a, show a quick video about what RED is. RED is a new international framework to help stop deforestation. It stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. Why do we need RED? Because destroying tropical forests releases more carbon dioxide than the entire global transport sector. Without a solution to deforestation, there won't be a solution to climate change. Tropical forests also sustain half of all life on Earth and generate vital services for the planet, such as producing rainfall and cooling the land surface. And 1.4 billion of the world's poorest people also depend on these forests for their survival. How will RED work? As well as reducing their own carbon dioxide emissions, under RED, industrialized countries will pay developing nations to keep their forests standing. Until now, forests have only had economic value when cut for their wood or cleared for their land. An area of tropical forest the size of a football pitch is destroyed every four seconds. Increasingly, this is to satisfy global demand for products like timber, beef, soy, and palm oil. So who gets paid under RED? Countries that produce emissions from deforestation, plus countries that continue to conserve large areas of intact forest, countries that plant new trees, and countries that only use their forests sustainably. When will RED begin? Officially after 2012, if a new international climate treaty includes RED. But we cannot afford to wait, because once lost, these forests will be gone forever. And how much will it cost? That's a billion dollar question. To halve deforestation by 2020, financing for RED will need to scale up to an estimated $38 billion a year. But doing nothing is a trillion dollar disaster every year. So how will RED work? It will take more than just money. Many different stakeholders, from local farmers to national governments, will need to cooperate for RED to be effective. RED will only work if the needs and rights of indigenous people and local communities are respected. If governance is strengthened to ensure that payments don't end up in the wrong hands, and if monitoring systems are put in place to ensure that emissions reductions are real and permanent. So what next? Business as usual is not an option. Forest destruction is accelerating climate change and damaging the Earth's life support system. Red may be the last best chance to save tropical forests. But to get red right, we need to get ready for red now. So I hope this video gives some introduction to, to what red is all about. Um, you will soon find out that red isn't quite as simple as the video portrays. And there are some uh, little details such as um, uh, the percentage of emissions from uh, land use change and, and forest destruction versus the uh, transportation sector. Uh, those are numbers that are, are still contested, um, but the, the primary point is that, that uh, forest destruction is a major contributor to um, uh, forest uh, carbon emissions, and for that reason it, it needs to be included in uh, any policies for mitigating climate change. But just to give you a quick uh, idea of um, where we're working um, and who we're working with, um, this is a map of our project, uh, the community's potential project area. Um, 
if they if they choose if they choose to develop a, a red project. Uh, you'll see in green is an area called uh, La Sierra Cojolita, which is a community reserve of uh, three indigenous uh, Maya communities established in 1992, um, and now that area is, is under threat as the community's populations increase um, from cattle and, and agriculture. Um, and there, it's a population of over about 30,000 people uh, between the, the three different communities. And, and as you can see from this map uh, of carbon density in Chiapas, uh, if you look to the far right uh, where the brown is the most dense, um, that is where our project area is located. Um, and uh, you'll see it's very ideal for, uh, in terms of the amount of carbon that is uh, in the area. So I can switch back uh, to this to the former map and you'll see um, above the yellow area is Guatemala, that's the Guatemalan border and um, you'll see over where the brown is, it, it matches up pretty well. Uh, so Brian is going to give a, a little bit of an introduction about uh, how carbon markets actually work and then we'll jump into um, uh, talking about the criticisms of red and, and, and how we're dealing with them. So Brian, whenever you're ready. So the idea behind uh, carbon market, there are basically two structures, a compliance or regulatory market and a voluntary market. Uh, in the compliance market, which is an example of which is the California market, which was recently activated this year, uh, there's a mandatory cap set on emissions and entities that are not able to achieve their emission cap can either reduce their emissions or for a certain percentage of emissions offset those by <coughs> from other activities. In the voluntary market, uh, there's no regulatory cap on emissions, either um, speculative investors or or businesses or individuals uh, who have an interest in, in reduce, offsetting their emissions can do so voluntarily by purchasing credits. Uh, so in both cases, and uh, when credits are purchased through a standard, there's an audit and the clearinghouse for the financial exchange is a registry, such as the verified carbon standard registry um, called market, which is uh, for the voluntary standard internationally um, and, and the California Air Resources Board uh, clearinghouse registry. In these cases, the quantity of credits that is eligible to be purchased is listed on the registry after an audit has been completed of the particular project, in this case a forestry project, and the, uh, the purchaser of the credits will then uh, purchase those send the money to the registry, purchase the credits, and the credits will be canceled and retired. Uh, then the money, or at least a percentage of it, will then flow back uh, to, to the project itself. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as you can see, thank you for that, Brian. Uh, the little image that we have on the, on the slide right now is a, a, a drawing that we used with our communities and workshops this past February to explain to them um, how the carbon markets work um, and, uh, and sort of summarizes what, what, what Brian just described. So uh, we're going to start with um, the first criticism about red and, and Annalise is going to uh, describe it for us. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so, Red has a couple points of contention. Um, the human rights uh, international advocates have criticized it um, for lacking a human voice and also focusing too exclusively on carbon credits. Um, and in terms of these criticisms, I think that both FPIC and benefit distribution, which we'll talk about a little later, are important points to consider for ecologic moving forward. Um, so we'll start with um, the FPIC which stands for Free, Prior, and Informed Consent, and it's um, codified in the UN Declaration of 
of rights for indigenous peoples. Um, FPIC is a rights-based approach which emphasizes the right to self-determination, land, territories, and natural resources and culture, and also the right to freedom from racial and gender discrimination. Um, and these points are particularly important um, in the lens of red for um, indigenous and local communities that have been historically marginalized and disenfranchised. Um, in the human rights perspective, FPIC is imperative before projects can move forward. Um, and in terms of RED, this becomes a point of contention uh, specifically to when we're talking about land tenure issues, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, about later as well. Um, for now, it's important to think about who is involved with the FPIC process versus who is then affected by the project that comes out of it. And this is where um, we'll talk about land tenure as well. Um, a, a point to bring up for FPIC as well is that it's currently not a requirement for um, Red Plus through the UNFCCC, which is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and this brings up one of the broad criticisms of Red, um, which is that there's a lack of consistent and enforceable safeguards for the vulnerable uh, groups and communities in project areas. Thanks, Annalie. And now, now Brian is going to uh, give his response to uh, this particular criticism, um, talk about some of the ways it's, it's being addressed or still needs to be addressed and, and how it relates to our project. Yes, so the, it is true that the UNFCCC does not currently require the FPIC process, uh, but at the Cancun agreement, there was a commitment to follow the UN Indigenous Rights Declaration and further to define how uh, Indigenous people can be more involved and engaged in RED project development and execution. The project Kohalita that we're developing in particular will conform to the Climate, Community, and Biodiversity CCB standards which require a, a process of determining social benefits uh, from the project and monitoring those benefits to ensure that they occur over time. We're also encouraging the state of Chiapas to adopt the RED Plus Social and Environmental Standards, RED Plus SES, which explicitly requires an FPIC process. The RED Plus F SES has also been promoted by the Red Offset Working Group, ROW, which has provided policy recommendations for the state of Chiapas and Acre in Brazil to participate in the California compliance market for forest carbon offsets. And they also encourage the Red Plus SES FPIC uh, be adopted at state levels as an auditable standard for uh, these human rights issues or, or um, social safeguards. The, uh, we are um, working very carefully on our project at trying to work with three different communities, the Tetzales, Choles, and Lacandones, who have had a history of, of disagreement and challenges together. Uh, so we're conduct we've been conducting workshops in each of the three communities to try to engage the, the leaders and community members and understand their concerns. We're going through a process called the, the Social Biological um, Impact Assessment, SBIA, as part of, uh, part of CCB uh, to uh, work in a very structured way to understand what the problem of the deforestation is and what its roots are and then what are appropriate interventions that, and results that we can achieve from that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the next criticism. Annalie, again, will be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the next uh, point of contention that we've identified is a benefit distribution of red benefits. And here there are questions regarding who actually receives the benefits from the Red Plus projects. And specifically, um, this is a question of payments for carbon credits and sequestration, since a lot of red projects focus um, very strongly on that aspect. Um, and specifically when we're then talking about this, um, concerns arise over what's called elite benefit capture. 
and this is when the projected and um, predict, predicted benefits from the project for a large community then don't actually reach the entire group that it's supposed to benefit. What instead then happens is that these benefits are taken up or, quote, captured by a smaller group of individuals um, in that community, and often these individuals will have a higher standing or more power within their community group. Um, and so because of this issue, Red Plus runs the risk of enforcing and exacerbating existing inequalities within communities. Um, and this, this point is, um, can be illustrated by an example within the ecologic proposed project area that um, has to do with land title holders and the land tenure issue that I brought up earlier. Um, land title holders in the project area have a higher status and more control. And these, um, there are only about 1,600 of a total of approximately 30,000 of the, the community members in all the groups that are land title holders. And because of how carbon rights are determined within Red Plus, um, these 1,600 are then technically the only ones with the right to the carbon, and therefore would, in a traditional model, be the only ones receiving those payments directly. Um, so this is an issue that needs to be looked at more closely. And Brian will be responding. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> yes, uh, this is an issue that's a, a bit in the future for us, but we have been uh, nonetheless contemplating. It, it is true that these common arrows uh, do have the legal rights to the carbon in the reserve. And what we are trying to balance is often called a 3E model of equity, efficiency, and effectiveness, uh, the equity, of course, how evenly benefits are spread with, within a, a community or population, efficiency, meaning how many benefits, in this case carbon credits, per cost, uh, including transaction costs of getting a project going, uh, and opportunity costs you have to pay people to forego other uses of the land. Um, and then finally, effectiveness in terms of, of how much carbon one is able to generate, how, how many benefits one is able to produce uh, overall. Um, and in this case, clearly, in terms of, of, of effectiveness, it's most important to deal with these common arrows who have otherwise have an opportunity to convert the forest land, um, and other people do not legally. Uh, and, and also in terms of efficiency, it's um, easy to deal with these people because they've already been identified and have, um, have some history of receiving payments in the past from the state government. Uh, but in terms of equity, clearly, uh, this type of system falls short. And uh, there will need to be likely reductions in, in how, how those people are paid so that there's more even participation among the communities in the project. Uh, and the project is not, not sabotaged and fulfills its development objectives of what, as well as uh, providing some means of livelihood for the communities as a whole uh, for protecting their forest land. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Now we're going to Meredith. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the credibility of carbon credits that could come from a Red Plus program and their potential for reducing overall carbon emissions at a national, international, and even global level. Um, additionality, permanence, and leakage are three of the very common issues that are raised when discussing Red Plus at a more local or project level. I'll just go quickly through these and explain them for those who might not be familiar with the concepts. Additionality in the context of a Red Plus program becomes a concern when we look at overall forests protected we need to make sure that Red Plus programs create additional carbon storage by protecting forested areas that would not have been protected otherwise. Um, this requires a strong initial baseline or reference level to be established in order to assess whether the emissions reductions are additional to what would have happened without the program. Leakage is another issue that threatens credibility of Red Plus carbon emission reductions. Without proper monitoring, deforestation can shift from one area to another, possibly one outside of, of a program area, resulting in little to no actual reduction in carbon. Um, finally, permanence. Without 
constant funding or a defined time period of the program, Red Plus runs the risk of being stopped at some point down the line. This is especially important over the long term since sustaining carbon emission reduction is central to reducing climate change. If projects aren't receiving funding, they may return to their destructive activities that threaten, that threaten the forest. So with these three, these three issues, monitoring will be, will be vital in assessing each of these issues and will be discussed a little bit more later um, in the presentation. Um, I want to go on. There are a couple other criticisms of Red Plus. There are many other criticisms <laughs> of Red Plus, <laughs> but I will only mention a couple additional ones here. Um, and these specific issues have more implications when we look at Red Plus within a larger carbon market. So one of the concerns is that with the purchase of carbon credits by industries within a carbon market, the emphasis then becomes on changing the behavior at a local or project level without extending it to the consumer level. In this sense, um, Red Plus fails to address the actions of the primary polluters or hold them accountable for their contribution to carbon emissions. Um, this is especially true of many local communities involved in Red Plus. They often see themselves as being more affected for having to change their behavior while the corporations and industries can go on with business as usual. In this sense, um, Red Plus does little to raise awareness on the part of the industry or carbon credit consumer and basically threatens the sustainability of a Red Plus project. Moreover, having Red Plus credits traded within a carbon market could result in a focus on the credits themselves and reaching emissions and deforestation goals rather than on designing projects that will benefit the local communities and be sustainable and permanent. Um, countries want to stop deforestation and industries are eager to reach their reduced emissions goals. This therefore drives them towards how many credits they can get out of a project and could lead to the promotion of carbon farming processes in order to get more credits out of a particular area of land. And this approach basically undermines the social or human aspect that is central to the success of Red Plus programs. So the outcome here we see is there's a, a disconnect between the means of reaching emissions reduction goals and the, the, act, the ends. Um, and this, along with additionality, leakage, and permanence, significantly threaten, I think, the, the credibility of carbon credits that could come from a Red Plus program and might not reduce overall emissions. Thank you, Meredith. And Brian, uh, if you could respond. Carbon credit exchange is a complicated subject, and there are a variety of different perspectives with, with, with which one could look at it. Uh, although it is true that it can be perceived as, as an excuse to pollute, I won't disagree. Uh, there are other lenses within which one can see this financial transfer. Uh, one of those is that it's monetizing the full value of a forest, uh, providing an opportunity to monetize some ecological benefits that have otherwise been an external benefit that has not been monetized effectively in our economic system in prior cases. Uh, and in, in these cases, one could, could even argue that, that these, these examples of, of uh, forest farms, of which there are a number of plantations of eucalyptus in Uruguay, for example, that have been verified under the forest under the, the verified carbon standard for forest carbon offsets, and are owned by a number of, of timber industry organizations and um, private companies, uh, are a legitimate use of that type of a system of providing some monetary financial resources to improve the rate of return uh, of these plantations that otherwise would not have been planted. Um, in these grasslands in Uruguay uh, for carbon sequestration as well as timber benefit. Uh, so it's providing a more efficient economic system in that way of trying to internalize some of the ecological benefits we otherwise uh, would take for granted and, and not fully monetize. And we're getting some carbon benefit atmospherically because of that, legitimately. Um, in addition, there's a perspective that uh, that with, with um, a, a number of 
reduced emission from deforestation forest conservation projects. Uh, these are particularly important in rural tropical countries uh, such as Chiapas where the carbon emissions uh, from deforest from forest loss can far exceed the emissions from transportation in industry uh, because they're fairly undeveloped places. So there needs to be some kind of mechanism which typically comes from the developing world uh, which could be could be fund based entirely and not market based at all uh, to provide some incentive uh, for for these people to to lower their emissions uh, through forest conservation, uh, there can be international agreements that that effectively allow this. Uh, you know, many other ways besides the market, but certainly forest conservation is a very important tool to reduce global emissions when one is including uh, undeveloped uh, tropical countries. Uh, further, there's. Um, yeah, moving on, I guess to uh, to our our particular project and some of these technical questions regarding the the these issues of, of permanence, leakage, uh, the baseline, and additionality. We are working fairly diligently, uh, though we don't have all the financial resources in line yet, to to proceed with this project to an international standard, uh, an auditable standard, so that the technical requirements have all been approved in a methodology. Uh, this would primarily be the verified carbon standard uh, or some modification of the Air Resources Board Climate Action Reserve standard for the California market. In these cases, additionality has been proven by providing uh, some evidence of a, of a standing forest and a, both a present and elevated threat of loss of that forest. Uh, baseline has or what's called a reference emission level or REL at, at the state level has been required to be developed either from historical, um, typically historical 10-year satellite imagery of what rates of forest loss have been on a state basis uh, and in some cases using projected, projected data based on access to the forest and population demographics um, but we, we favor the historical approach because the projected approach is too subject to manipulation and gaming. Uh, in terms of leakage, we also favor a jurisdictional type approach or a state level approach where leakage can be monitored for an entire uh, political state and to minimize the chance that a, a project is not legitimately counting its credits and is simply displacing the forestry agent somewhere else. Um, in addition, the verified carbon standard requires the establishment of what's called a leakage belt or a leakage zone around the periphery of the project, which basically allows uh, an opportunity for an activity such as pasturing or agricultural use to occur uh, around outside of the forest area, uh, around the periphery of the project, uh, letting some of the pressure off, so to speak. Um, and then, uh, and those those credits are are deducted. Uh, then there's a uh, but but ideally you'd have less less carbon at risk uh, in those areas. They would be degraded or secondary forest um, rather than, than your primary forest that you're interested in conserving. Uh, lastly, regarding the impermanence risk, the, the verified carbon standard requires a risk assessment uh, which is audited based on, on project level administrative risk uh, as well as socio-political risk and natural disturbance risk and uh, Credits are required to be withheld during the duration of the project while the risk is reassessed at every five-year auditing period um, and uh, periodically some of those credits can be released to the market but a percentage is held all the way until the end uh, to ensure that the credits um, are, are fully realized for the pro project crediting period which is typically around 30 years minimum in a, in a verified carbon standard project. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So our last uh, a point of contention in this presentation, there are many other criticisms uh, we'd like to emphasize, but for, for the sake of this presentation, um, I'll be talking about uh, the role of government and at what scale uh, government should be involved in regulating um, forest red, uh, red projects. Um, and so there, there are. Uh, this closely relates uh, to this last topic um, about monitoring for 
um, issues such as leakage, um, which means, again, basically displaced uh, forest destruction, um, where there are two, three scenarios that, that are, are being presented um, as how, at what level the government should be involved in regulation uh, within uh, a jurisdictional system, so a state level system. Uh, the first scenario is where uh, the jurisdictional system uh, established is uh, basically in charge of establishing the baseline, the carbon brace baseline um, for the region um, and, uh, and for, for these projects. And then projects are then credited, these local scale uh, red projects are then credited uh, directly for the sale of any carbon credits. The second scenario, uh, still within a, a jurisdictional or state level system, uh, you have the, the jurisdiction uh, being in charge of setting up the baseline and also doing any monitoring of uh, carbon stock. Um, and uh, this is where you would catch problems such as um, the displacement of destruction or, or leakage. Um, and in this scenario, uh, projects can be credited directly or through, um, through the government as well. Um, there are situations where the land is not necessarily privately or communally owned, uh, in which case the government would need to uh, manage uh, the, the accounting of, of the sale of these carbon credits. And then the last scenario, um, uh, does not involve uh, direct crediting to projects. So the jurisdiction is, in char is overseeing monitoring the establishment of the baseline and also the crediting. Um, and this is something that, this is the scenario that Mexico is leaning towards, uh, in which case uh, it's possible that the project that the communities um, within the project area we're working in would not receive payments directly uh, from buy buyers or consumers of carbon credits. It would have to go through um, the government. Um, and this presents uh, various different um, uh, benefits and, and disadvantages. Uh, I think we as, Eco as Carbon Plus, the Carbon Plus program and here at Ecologic are in favor of scenario two because it addresses uh, a lot of the uh, emissions reduction credibility issues that we were talking about in the previous uh, slide uh, while also allowing um, projects to receive credits directly um, and uh, avoiding any potential corruption problems with government uh, managing um, the sale of carbon credits. Whereas in the third scenario, um, that can be a risk uh, depending on the type of government that's, that's implementing. Um, so Brian is now going to explain how, how we're, how we're uh, our thoughts around this particular issue. Well, based on the prior discussion regarding some of the technical issues and the importance of establishing a baseline at a state level uh, so that there's not gaining of a baseline, particularly setting it uh, to be advantageous carbon credit, cred carbon credit uh, crediting for a particular project. We're really supportive of jurisdictional accounting um, in addition for the leakage concerns, being able to monitor leakage across the state instead of just on a project level. In addition, jurisdictional accounting has also been strongly promoted by the Red Offset Working Group for participation in the compliance market in California. So at a minimum, we favor scenario one, where a jurisdictional or state level baseline is, is established. We also um, favor scenario two, where, where credits can also go directly to, to the state for policy adjustments, uh, such as discontinuing agricultural subsidies, for example. States themselves, by instituting that type of policy, could potentially be eligible for getting credits if they show that forest cover due to agricultural threats has increased from a historical date when the subsidies were in place to 
to a, a date after this, the subsidies were removed. Uh, and um, leakage monitoring also can occur at this, at this level of scenario two. As Andrea said, we're concerned about corruption possibilities and lack of power that the project would have uh, a lack of incentives for the communities to continue to be engaged in the project in scenario three, where all the credits would go to the state before being dispersed. So uh, we are working with the state of Chiapas and have active communications with, with, with uh, their staff, including the man Ricardo Hernandez, who, who was uh, once working for an NGO, now Paloma, a partner on this project in Chiapas. And now he works for the state on their RED project. So we have active communications with the state to try to encourage one of these first two scenarios uh, for the state of Chiapas so that we can have our pro project uh, accurately account for the carbon credits uh, but also be able to benefit uh, financially from, from the work that the communities, uh, can, the work the communities do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, and one thing I, I forgot to mention is that um, in some countries, uh, scenario three might be the only option uh, because a lot of uh, forested land is state owned, in which case um, payments would have to go through through the government. But um, in the case of, of Mexico, we, we think we, as Brian said, we, we, there is some room for, for maybe adjusting policy. Um, but yeah, so these, as we mentioned before, these are, are only four of, of many criticisms, um, but ones that uh, strongly relate to, to uh, the situation um, our indigenous colleagues are facing in Chiapas, and um, the the one of the important points that that we would like everyone to to take away is is that uh, this ultimately uh, the decision of whether or not to participate and how how that project is developed if the communities choose to participate is is ultimately the community's decision and Ecologic is. Uh, dedicated to providing the communities with the information and skills that they need um, to make those decisions accurately. And also, um, RED goes much beyond just um, the simple purchasing um, and selling of carbon credits. And um, there is also many additional benefits uh, that can, can result from RED in addressing conservation challenges that um, in our particular area, project area, have not been able to be addressed um, by by other means. Uh, but at this point, we want to open it to uh, all of you to ask questions. Um, and here, us, the Carbon Plus team, will be happy to respond as best as we can. So. I'm just figuring out how to unmute everyone. Okay. All right, you all should be able to uh, uh, ask your questions. Oh yeah, my what? Well, I probably I don't know if you heard the news, but she's pregnant. We're having a, a girl. If you have any questions, if you could actually send us a chat and then we'll unmute you so, <laughs> so we don't hear everybody's conversation. And if anyone within the Ecologic team would like to start with a few questions while um, the audience <laughs> or our guests in in who are here in person feel free okay Megan let me unmute you okay it's all yours Megan Meg we can hear or you're unmuted if you'd like to talk Oh. 
Are you muted on your own computer, Meg, perhaps? Or you can type a question. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you can also uh, type the question if you need. <laughs> um, I, I have a question, I guess, to add on to the, the benefit distribution uh, part of the conversation. And Assuming that the scenario one or two is what's adopted, where communities can directly receive benefits, what um, what models have you been looking at for then once a community does get access to to the income flows from from the self carbon credits, how to distribute that so that there isn't this potential for just elites to to get the benefit? Sort of examples of other projects and how mm -hmm. they've done it in a way that that you think is optimal. Yeah, I, I can take a stab at this first, Brian, and then you can follow up if that's all right with you. Um, there, there is um, one project that we've been looking at pretty closely uh, is the Surui Carbon Project in uh, Brazil in the Amazon. Um, they this is a project that uh, Forest Trends um, helped to develop along with. Uh, several other more local institutions and uh, they they have actually set up a green fund um, which the credits essentially go into this green fund and then the communities are able to decide collectively how to in reinvest um, uh, the money in that green fund uh, towards other possible livelihood options that also complement um, uh, the emission reductions that the red project is already trying to achieve uh, so so a, a green fund is is a pretty um, common scenario um, or investing in other types of uh, public goods um, that benefit a, a larger community um, rather than just dividing um, the payments between uh, the people that are have have the right to carbon um, in in the case of, of our communities, if we split those earnings um, across 1,600 people, um, the, it, the earnings have a much smaller impact than they would if they were kept whole and, and invested in, in higher impact um, ac activities. But Brian, if you'd like to also respond. No, I think that was fine. Great. All right. So we have a question from Meg Cushing. Um, how do you monitor whether credits for the same tract of land are sold on multiple markets? Do you want to take this one, Brian? Okay. Yes. When when one undergoes an audit, a particular standard, one is required legally to divulge to the auditor. Is it a question? Uh, on the form of whether uh, the the project is participating in another standard in another market, um, and so yeah, one is, is legally bound to to divulge that information. Uh, if that is true, uh, then the carbon quantities must be be reconciled. You can't collect any more than you're already claiming in the, in the other market. Uh, if not, then uh, then it's Project is registered, then the, the amount is subtracted. Uh, and sold and retired. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Meg? Uh, we'll move on to the the next one um, uh, from Grace. Ma, Ma Giacusi, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and Grace says, I would like to ask a question regarding IPs using forest for fuel, in this case pastoralists. Um, have you encountered 
such in your project? If so, how can this be addressed um, for Red Plus to succeed? Um, yes, we we in our project area um, uh, we do have some uh, use. If I remember correctly, Brian, feel free to jump in. Um, uh, if you think I'm saying something inaccurately, but uh, there is some use of, of forests uh, for fuel, um, but not the, really the biggest driver of deforestation is um, uh, ag agriculture and and cattle. Um, and so, in in this case, we're we're addressing those two issues, um, or still exploring because this is still also, as Brian mentioned earlier, um, further ahead in the process for us, but. Um, looking into um, ways to sustainably intensify agriculture so communities uh, farming practices are a bit more efficient and um, are, do not require the continued clearing of forest um, and also the same goes goes for cattle also trying to make um, their cattle ranching practices uh, more sustainable and intensified so that um, they can raise more cattle on smaller amount of land. But so, yeah, I have a couple of responses here. Um, one is that in terms of, of quantification, a number of some methodologies in the verified carbon standard uh, allow for crediting for reduced fuel wood use, uh, and some do not. Uh, those that do require that the carbon inventory include down wood, uh, down dead wood, lying dead wood, uh, or slash, um, and so that that can be quantified over time what the baseline of that is and if more of that, which is typically used as fuel wood, uh, is retained. In addition, uh, the project activities that are typically employed to reduce this type of consumption and carbon loss uh, typically involve improved uh, wood stove or alternative fuel, um, uh, like a propane or natural gas system, uh, to to reduce the consumption of wood, uh, the demand for it. Um, in many of these cases, including intensification of agriculture, um, there, there are sometimes uh, perverse outcomes um, where people with improved uh, cook stoves um, find that you know, it's, it's so effective at generating heat that they end up using it for longer periods of time or to dry their clothes or, or for other things. Uh, similarly, with, with some types of intensification of agriculture, people will see that they're so productive on, on, on so much land and they can reap so much financial gain, they can keep on expanding with those same practices and, and gain even more. Uh, so we have to be careful um, in how we structure these things and, and monitoring human behavior and, and getting these things right. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so Catherine uh, Savala has a, a very good question. How are the local communities responding to this project? So um, we uh, had one of our first uh, workshops this past February to introduce the communities to to the idea. Um, but the, the well, somewhat introduce the communities to to the idea of of. Uh, what a red project actually is, and I sort of have to um, give some context uh, before I answer this question. Um, are the communities that we've been uh, working with were receiving payments from um, the uh, state government, Chapas' state government, um, under the name of Red, and they were receiving uh, about two hundred. The, the land title holders were receiving about two hundred dollars um, a month over two years. Um, those payments just ended in December and um, and this has created a couple situations for for us. Um, one, the, the payments weren't, uh, the results of the payments weren't being monitored so uh, the payments weren't actually red payments. They weren't coming from credits that were um, being monitored in our project area and then being sold to a buyer. Um, and so, but this created one, created a, 
a confusion w within our community members about what RED actually is. Um, so that's one thing we clarified this past February. Um, but the other situation is created is that the communities are, are interested in RED, but, but because of this expectation established by on um, the state government's payments, their, their interest is in um, uh, an, an inaccurate form of RED. Um, and so what happened is we, this past February, we um, informed the communities about what is actually required to establish a, a RED project. Um, and, and made them realize that it, it takes a lot more work and, and, and you're probably not gonna, they're probably not gonna start uh, seeing benefits of it um, for at least two years um, while the project is being initially set up and going through a, an accreditation process. Um, but the communities are so far interested in, in exploring. Um, however, they'll be making final a final decision about whether to move forward with next steps in the projects, which would involve um, a boundary clarification um, and a social and biodiversity impact assessment. Um, they're they're making um, they'll be making decisions about whether or not to move forward with those next steps at the end of this month. And Andrea, I'm sorry, I know that we're running out of time, but it's probably worth mentioning. You were there, so you can explain it more. But how the the children of comuneros and the other like next generation is responding to this? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that's, that's actually a, a good point. Um, the, the, the workshops that we carried out this past February weren't just informative, they were actually uh, very interactive, uh, where we did an analysis of, of um, different factors that could impede the project. Um, and we did this with a, a group of participants that the community selected themselves, about 20 to 30 people, um, for this portion of, of the workshops. And this gave an, an opportunity to the sons and daughters of land title holders who themselves have their own families and are possibly um, fathers and possibly grandfathers or grandmothers themselves. But um, the, the, these particular um, demographic of, of the population of the communities um, expressed that this was one of the, the few moments where they've actually been able to um, express an opinion um, in within uh, the decision-making um, system in the communities. Usually they're not able to have much say in what goes on in, in these workshops. Gave them an opportunity to do that. So they definitely um, uh, looked at the project uh, positively in, in that regard. But yeah, the short answer is that it's, 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 a, com it's a complicated question, <laughs> Catherine, like many things with RED. Um, but we, we are only moving forward with the project as long as the communities give consent to um, each step. Right. And making sure that we're using getting into the traditional decision-making processes uh, and not sort of accelerating or pushing decisions, but really fitting into their usual way of making decisions. Yeah, very, very good point, Barbara. Do you want to add anything, Brian, um, before we wrap up? All right. No, um, except to say that, that you know, though we're, we're, we're really trying to be very faithful to an extensive free prior and informed consent process, uh, this comes at a cost. Uh, you know, the, the time that in, in energy and resources we invest in it. Um, and and it, it's uh, a bit of a trade-off, I think, in the red policy arena as a whole. Uh, it's a tricky one to navigate, I think, of, of being very careful and thorough in the steps we go through, which necessarily reduces the benefits uh, for communities, at least in terms of reducing the, the scope of projects that end up being feasible uh, because of the cost um, incurred. Uh, and scale to which the projects need to occur to offset that cost. Uh, so there's a tricky balance here between doing a project thoroughly with integrity um, and also providing community benefits widely. Uh, the last comment I'd like to make regards this, uh, this tricky situation of whether credits are an excuse to pollute. And, and I, I think Ecologic's position on that generally is uh, 
though it, it can be perceived that way, and, and we certainly advocate emission reductions wherever possible. The scale of the climate change problem and emissions are, is large enough that we should try to, to use every, every possible tool we can because emission reductions are not occurring very rapidly on their own uh, to try to reduce emissions globally, including uh, conservation of forests. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very, a very good point, Brian. Um, so I, I hope this, this has um, addressed some of your questions um, uh, about RED and, and, and how Ecologic is, is approaching it. Um, and we're very happy to um, entertain any other questions you might have. Feel free to contact any one of us. And also, I've just uh, put up a, the next slide, which is about our, our next green bag, uh, technology in the field. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>